Ray Evernham talked about the downfall of SRX on the Dale Jr. download. Ray Evernham went on the Dale Jr. download this week and they talked a little bit of everything. Ray going into the Hall of Fame, his book that he has coming out, William Byron winning the Daytona 500. You also had him talking about the relationship between the 24 car and the three car back in the day. And Dale, of course, brought up the demise of the SRX series. Of course, we all know by now that SRX was selling tickets to all six of their events and then randomly announced at the very end of 2023 that they had suspended their entire season and would not be carrying on, which is unfortunate because SRX was a fun event. It was made for TV motorsport entertainment. We all knew that it wasn't a legitimate championship, but it was still fun and entertaining. And on ESPN, it gave you something to watch on Thursday nights in the summer when your baseball team completely sucked. So it was worth it for that. But in the latter years of SRX, years two and years three, it kind of lost a bit of its luster. And Ray went into that. He was talking to Dale Jr. And he had a number of things to say about it, which was things that we maybe already knew a little bit, but it was also nice to kind of hear it from the horse's mouth. I've never understood that saying, but we went ahead and used it anyways. But Ray essentially was in charge of just about everything. He's in charge of the cars. He's in charge of creative control on the competition side. He helped set the tracks, the roster for the driver lineup and kind of handled all of that. And meanwhile, they had financial partners. They had George Pine as well as Sandy Montag on the TV side that would take care of the financials, right? They were out there to make sure that we had a television partnership, that you had sponsorship and you had money to run this series. And Ray, of course, like I said, handle the competition side. Tony Stewart was kind of the face of SRX and it seemed to be going really well for year one. You had your six races, 12 different drivers. You brought in some big names for it. Chase Elliott racing Bill Elliott and you had Ryan Blaney racing Dave Blaney, albeit didn't really last uh, when it went to Sharon. But at the end of the day, you kind of had a good mix of, of drivers. You had some old guys, some big names that were older and, you know, maybe not recently retired, but, you know, still somewhat relevant. And then you brought in a relevant guy that was still actively racing every now and then. Plus, you had your local short track hero that would be given essentially the all-star car for that weekend. And it introduced... America to guys like Doug Kobe and Luke Finhouse, who had absolutely amazing runs in those cars and, you know, really put themselves on the map. Doug Kobe continues to race up in the Northeast and Luke Finhouse has kind of parlayed that into an ARCA career and he's trying to keep getting that traction to come up. So, so ultimately, SRX did do its job when it came down to it, at least introducing people to America. I mean, at the end of the day, Ernie Francis Jr. basically owes all of his Indy Lights career to SRX and making him sort of a household name amongst motorsport fans more than he already should have been thanks to his incredible run that he had in the Trans Am series. But not everything was, you know, rainbow and roses and cotton candy behind the scenes at SRX. After the first season, Ray had an idea on which way the series should go direction wise. And apparently the other people that were involved in this series had a different idea and they wanted to go in another direction. So Ray basically said that he bowed out which was maybe the best thing or the worst thing that could have happened for SRX. Best thing for Ray was the fact that he, you know, wasn't a part of it anymore. And the worst thing was the, for SRX that Ray wasn't a part of it anymore, ultimately. So SRX decided to kind of change up their model. They got, they got away from the local short track hero, and they went ahead and just sort of made half the roster current cup drivers, which at the end of the day, they needed to get ratings. They were trying to draw in people as much as they could, especially on Thursday night in year three. They were desperate to show ESPN that they could attract viewers. So they were trying to attract current cup drivers. You have Brad Keselowski, Denny Hamlin, Kyle Busch coming in. They're constantly going to the Haley Deegan well and trying to get her following to tune into these events. And what happened when you introduce current cup drivers? They went out there and dominated the race. Why? Because they're the best stock car drivers in the world. Of course, they were going to go out there and do that. And it kind of ruined the entire show. Where Tony Stewart might get a lead and then he would give up that lead to make the show good. Because again, this was motorsport entertainment. This is not a legitimate championship out there. These guys weren't doing that. They would straight up just sail off. And I think that kind of, at times, infuriated Tony Stewart. So you have that happening. And then you have Ray dropping something that was pretty interesting. Because we all know that they had financial issues. Ultimately, that's why the series you know, was suspended and will likely fold unless its assets are sold off. He said that they weren't moving forward financially at the end of the first season, which 
I think we all kind of knew. Their sponsorship model didn't really work. It was more B2B with the series and its sponsors, and I don't know how much money was exactly changing hands there, but it never really felt like they were attracting new sponsorship outside of what they already had. And they kind of just kept going back to those honeypots, if you will. And eventually those are going to tap out. So they weren't moving forward financially, which means that after year one, they were already maybe a little bit strapped for cash. Ray goes ahead and leaves. They have a different idea on what the direction for SRX is going to be. So they went ahead and went with that. And we know now that it ultimately didn't work. One thing I did find interesting that Ray said, and he said, I have a great relationship with the France family and a good relationship with IndyCar as well. And while the idea behind SRX wasn't to go to like a Michigan, Daytona, Talladega, like we saw with the old IROC series, he said they at least had explored the idea of running some sort of companion race with NASCAR and IndyCar. Whether that be shortening up a road course and running SRX there with IndyCar or NASCAR, or potentially running at like the Bull Ring in Las Vegas or the Charlotte Dirt Track when NASCAR is there. Some sort of companion race like that. And ultimately, I think that would have been a great idea. As much as I love going to the local short tracks, maybe tying it into like a race weekend would have helped attract some sort of viewership. One thing that SRX didn't need help with was attracting fans. Basically, every track they went to was packed out, minus like some of the dirt tracks seem to be you know, wishy-washy because stock cars don't belong on dirt tracks, but that's a conversation for a different day. When it came down to it, though, SRX just maybe couldn't figure it out. As dumb as that sounds and as simplistic and simpleton as it sounds, maybe they just couldn't get it down. George Pine and Sandy Montag are great at what they do, but when it came to connecting SRX with an audience, it just felt like there was always this disconnect. After year one, they didn't know what they wanted to be anymore. Do you want to just be NASCAR light? Do you want to be IROC? Are you trying to be this weird hybrid Frankenstein of the two of them? It seemed like it could never find its footing after that. And at the end of the day, it's just bad. One thing that they did mention again is the fact that Ray even brought up the point that they were trying to get Dale Jr. and Jeff Gordon to come join, maybe even a Jimmy Johnson. Those recently retired names that were massive. Sure, they got Tony Stewart, but at the end of the day, everybody kind of viewed this as Tony Stewart racing his own series just so Tony Stewart could win another championship. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if we would all do it if we could. But they never were able to attract those big names, and ultimately they were never really able to establish themselves amongst like a fan base that was maybe bigger than the 400,000 that would tune in each week. I remember they said that they wanted to have 3 million viewers when they were on CBS on Saturday night, and they averaged about 1.2. That's less than half of what they were hoping for. And then when they went over to ESPN for Thursday Night Thunder, they were getting around like 400 to maybe 550,000 viewers each week. Not ideal, especially at a time where you're trying to convince sponsors and your TV partner that like this is beneficial for both parties. So it was interesting to hear Ray talk about it. Will we ever see SRX come back? I don't think so. I think SRX is gone. And Ray talked about IROC and how he and his business partner now, Rob Kaufman, formerly of Michael Waltrip Racing and Chip Ganassi Racing, the mastermind of the charter system in NASCAR, have acquired the trademarks to IROC, which is really cool. He said they've acquired 35 IROC cars as well, vintage IROC cars, and he's looking to have a race at some point this year, a vintage race between those. And then what the future of it is, is kind of up in the air at this point. But like Ray said, I do believe that there is a business case to be made for an SRX type of series, and hopefully somebody can figure that out in the future because at the end of the day, a midweek series throughout the summer is pretty entertaining. Six weeks might just not be long enough, but there's got to be a way to do this. IROC was successful for a number of years. There's something that can be done here. So we'll wait and see. Let me know in the comments what you thought about Ray's comments on this. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.